So maybe you guys can relate with me on this, but I have this kind of love-hate relationship with indie movies. I'm being a bit dramatic here, but uh, I love them because they're cinematic. They have this shallow depth of field and there's bokeh balls everywhere, which is kind of the point of this tutorial. But uh, that's actually the exact reason why I fucking hate looking at indie movies, right? Uh, every single shot has to be cinematic. Every single shot has to have bokeh balls in the background. Even if it doesn't make sense, they'll put traffic lights, right? They'll put light bulbs. They'll put anything to generate these kind of fuzzy balls in the background because in their eyes, uh, that that's what makes them a real filmmaker, you know, bokeh balls equals quality, which I don't agree with. <laughs> uh, but either way, uh, let me show you how to make bokeh balls in this tutorial, because I guess that that's a thing. Um, either way, uh, Blender, I'm using version 2.92 alpha. You can use literally any version. I'm going to be using Eevee to render, so ideally, you know, use 2.8 or above, because that's when Eevee came out. But, you know, you could even use cycles with this. Okay, uh, with that being said, uh, bokeh balls. So, cube and the light, uh, let's get rid of them. In fact, by the way, this, just, just a side note, this is going to be the easiest tutorial I've ever done. Like, we barely have to do anything. Just saying. Uh, shading workspace, what I'm gonna do is go to the world shader, which is kind of like something we never go to unless we're setting, an, uh, setting up an HDRI. But again, uh, the world shader is basically a bunch of nodes that lets us decide what does the background look like. And usually you're either hiding this or again, making it an HDRI. Uh, we're gonna be doing something a bit different. So, uh, first thing you're gonna do, add in a Voronoi texture node uh, right into the world output. So, you know, we see this uh, no matter where we look, right? It's the environment, it's the world, and Voronoi texture is the one that kind of kind of generates a pattern using a bunch of circles. You don't see it right now, kind of looks like a bunch of cell noise, but uh, if we were to filter this saying, you know, only show the results, not mass, but math, uh, only show the results if the output is like less than, you know, some number, uh, you can see we're getting a bunch of different circles with a bunch of different sizes. And by the way, uh, if you didn't know, uh, textures and basically every node that you've ever, you know, been accustomed to, uh, you can use them in the world shader. It's just that nobody does because it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, let's go to the camera view. So what we're seeing so far is a couple balls. We want to have more of them and we want them to have motion and blinking. And of course, we want them to blur to get that bokeh effect. Uh, to do this, first of all, let's talk about the number of circles. Well, uh, that's going to be determined by this Voronoi texture. Right? So if we take the scale of the Voronoi texture, bring it up to something like 50, uh, we have more dots. And if we have less, we have less, etc. And you can also control the randomness or the distribution, right? I'm going to keep it random. Uh, second thing, and by the way, just so you, we have a cleaner workspace, um, we can do pass or part out to get rid of everything else. Um, second thing is, how do we make this uh, blurry circles, right? Because these are kind of like the light emission sources, right? The light bulbs uh, that the indie uh, director is putting there for no fucking reason. They, they call themselves cinematographers. Uh, these are the light sources, and now we just need to blur them out, right? And the way you do this uh, normally in cameras with depth of field. Uh, so just like uh, you do it there, uh, digitally, we can also do it with depth of field. So uh, enable depth of field was the point. <laughs> um, also, make your focal distance. In other words, what is the camera focusing on? Uh, make it very close. So something that's only like a meter away or maybe two meters away, not one dash, but like one. Uh, that's going to blur it out. And of course, the closer we make this, the more insane the blur is going to be until it's kind of like just a cloud, right? Uh, so what I recommend, keep it at one meter and then control kind of the size of the bokeh ball uh, with the aperture or the f-stop. So you bring this down and you get uh, bigger bokeh balls, okay? So already a ton of control. I haven't We haven't talked about this yet, uh, but the whole thing is procedural, right? Uh, where these balls are, how many there are, this is all controlled via nodes and also in-camera effects. Like how many blades should these uh, aperture things have? Should they be triangles? Should they be pentagons? Uh, you can control all this kind of stuff, including, by the way, zero means a circle. Uh, you know, don't specify the number of blades. Uh, you can also do anamorphic style effects as if you're filming with one of those fancy cameras. Uh, cinematographers are going to love that one. Uh, so you can play around with the ratio and stuff like that. But uh, what I want to talk about is how do we make this kind of look less cluttered and more kind of artsy and kind of like fairy lights and stuff like that. So uh, depth of field settings, you can mess with them. But let's uh, go back to nodes. Well, first of all, we have kind of like, and by the way, again, if you don't look through the camera with the depth of field, it just looks like a bunch of dots. It's the blurring, the depth of field that makes it look good. Um, to make this look a little less chaotic, we're going to need to set a threshold, right? This is what this less than is. It generates circles uh, from this Voronoi texture, but the less there are kind of, you know, uh, the fewer circles that actually make the cut, right? So you can think of it as a cutoff. So if we use this less than and bring it down, you can see instantly we got something that looks better. It's less cluttered. But again, uh, if we play this, right now I'm playing the animation, uh, nothing happens, right? Because the Voronoi texture itself, it's not moving, it's not rotating, it's not blinking, nothing, okay? Uh, so how do we add that? Well, 
easy way to do this, and this is kind of like a new edition, like 2.83 or something after, um, a lot of these texture nodes have four dimensions, right? Previously, it only had 3D settings, and now it has 4D settings with a uh, fourth dimension W slider, which we can think of as a seed, right? I mean, we don't need to think about it as a three-dimensional cross-section of a four-dimensional thing. It's a lot to think about, okay? And I'm just trying to flex on you guys, right? Um, this W slider is going to be the seed, right? And it looks like no matter what we change about it, it just kind of flickers and it's chaotic. But uh, if we were to change it by only a very gradual amount, so we just add 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, you could barely see it. And that's the point. It just shifted a tiny bit, right? So we somehow need to control it this way. Uh, to do this, instead of like keyframing and doing all that kind of stuff, uh, we're going to use drivers. So type in hash frame, and this is a driver that basically says the frame number we're on, which you can see over here, frame one, uh, two, three, four, right? Or we could uh, show it via the timeline, which is the reason I opened this up. Uh, whatever frame we're on, send it basically into this uh, fourth dimensional W slider, right? Um, and that kind of helps, but we, again, want it to be much slower. Take this frame, divide it by a big number, and I, I've already tested this, so even something like 100, way too fast. You can see it flickers, right? Uh, you want this to be more along the magnitudes of a couple thousand or 10,000, um, and this is going to be slow enough for it to look like a continuous motion without a lot of jumpiness, right? I mean, of course, that's also going to be dependent on your frame rate. Uh, more frames, it's going to look faster, so, you know, we need to make it three-ish times slower so that it goes back to normal, right? Uh, this is how we do the flickering, but this is essentially taking our Voronoi texture and using uh, the, 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 the method, <laughs> the method, the algorithm uh, that it uses to generate this. This noise is basically it scatters a bunch of points, says which fragments are closer to which, um, which you can see if you look at all this uh, color information, which I'm hiding, uh, all this color information, right? Um, what was the point? The point is it uses a bunch of math to make uh, circles blink in and out of existence, uh, which looks cool, but uh, we still don't have any kind of drifting motion, so let's talk about that. Uh, to do drifting, what we need to do is not necessarily mess around with like, you know, the algorithm. I, I, know, I know I keep throwing around that word, but it really is the word uh, that I'd use to describe this. Uh, we don't need to mess with the parameters of this, right? Uh, except for the vector, right? What we want to do is send different texture coordinates. In other words, where should the Bokeballs be? Uh, we need to change that over time, right? Uh, so let's add in texture coordinates. I think this either uses an object or generated uh, by default. I guess object uh, works as well. It doesn't matter. Just pick one of these object is fine. And you can see if we take this and do vector math and addition, where we can, you know, shift the X, which is going to shift the whole world. You can almost think of it as rotation in some sense. Uh, we do the same thing, right? We do frame divided by thousand might even be too fast, but let's see. Uh, no, that, that seems okay. Maybe even slower something like 7,000, slightly uh, faster than the other version. Uh, you can see that this gives us uh, some motion along, I guess, what is the x-axis, which looks diagonal because our camera's kind of pointing down. Um, that's okay, right? But it doesn't look, you know, too chaotic or too natural uh, because, you know, it's all drifting in one direction. It's almost like, why would there be light bulbs doing that? Uh, so what we need to do is, just like the Voronoi texture, we need to add randomness to the texture coordinates. Uh, to do this, so I'm going to add a noise texture. Noise texture is good for, you know, making anything look random. That, that's the general rule of thumb. Uh, you want to randomize your life? Just add a noise texture. You're getting bored of the same day or same thing day in, day out. Mess it up with some noise texture. You take this. Uh, ideally, the color, since it has XYZ information instead of just, you know, the same thing on XYZ. So color, vector information instead of float information. Uh, take this, mix it, and set this to linear light. Why? Uh, well, I've explained it a bunch of times, so I'm not going to get into it. Uh, but point is, the linear light is going to be the perfect way to combine uh, the original texture coordinates with noise in a way that now you can see they're all kind of drifting um, in different directions, right? We can have different amounts of influence. So when it's zero, it's going to be doing just that X motion. When it's one, it's going to be quite frankly too much. And when it's something else like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, uh, you see we got this nice kind of like, oh, maybe there's fireflies, you know, too many of them. There's a swarm like we should we should get the pesticide, but uh, it makes it look more chaotic. Right. And you can you can control parameters here, like the scale of this, which will make it look different. It's going to add more flickering or you can make it slower, bigger motions. Um, you, you could do a bunch of stuff here. Um, I'm not going to get too much into it. And by the way, again, uh, this all, this uh, <laughs> blurring effect is built into the camera settings, right? If we were to look at it here, you can see what we're doing basically is making Voronoi texture that has weird stretches. Some of them are doing some weird stuff, and that's because of the noise. Uh, but from here, it all kind of looks like circles, so it's fine.
Okay, final thing, coloring and stuff like that, and also rendering. Uh, basically, all these nodes that we've set up so far, just look at that uh, for the people who, you know, like looking at it this way, uh, and complain in the comments quite frequently that I don't do that. Um, we, basically, all those nodes are the base kind of mask, uh, if you want to think about it that way, and you want to think about the blurring almost as part of that mask, that depth of field stuff that we uh, did before. Um, this is all the mask. Now what we want to do is use this mask, this information, to drive color, right? We shouldn't have to do any extra, you know, math or anything like that. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in hue saturation value so we can control, you know, all those things. Uh, I'm going to use this mask to control the value, in other words, the brightness of this, and the difference between uh, not having this and, whoops, I guess it's better to just kind of view it like that, uh, the difference between this and actually having this hue saturation value, which looks identical, um, is now as we can actually, yeah, now we can actually tint it, is the point. So whatever color bokeh balls, we can have them. Um, also, if you want this to be brighter, because it kind of looks darker, because now we have color and stuff like that, uh, you can either bump it uh, using the vibrance here, or the value, and I think you can make that a big number. Um, that's one way you could do it, or if you want to, you know, have a bit more control, use a node. So use something like multiply. So again, this is the vibrance, or I think vibrance is probably the wrong word. It's kind of how illuminated it is. It's the luminance. Uh, you multiply it by a bigger number, it's going to be brighter. Uh, if you make it too big, it's going to be too big. And by the way, blue might be something to enable here, which might be only visible if they're big enough. Let's see, bloom off, bloom on. We might need to mess around with threshold and stuff like that, yeah. Uh, point is, if you pick the right settings, you can add in some bloom as well. So before, after, whatever. Uh, we can now pick the color. Again, it's going to drive the uh, brightness or lightness or vibrance or whatever you want to call it uh, using this. We can also add in a bit more randomness, right? We can use these two to change the hue, the color, or the saturation, how intense it is. Uh, saturation might be a good idea since we want some variety, right? Maybe we should have this one not go th through the multiplication. So some of them are going to be an intense turquoise, and some of them are going to be very dim. Additionally, and this is where it gets cool, uh, Voronoi texture, uh, with this distance thing that we've been using to generate these circles, um, again, we also get fragments, which are going to take a while to load because of the depth of field and all that. Easier to see this way. Um, of course, they're distorted because of the noise texture, but so are the, so are the circles, so it's fine. Uh, we can use the color as basically a random number generator, right? You take this, you connect it to the hue, and now we get the same thing as before, but now with some color variation. Of course, you probably don't want it to be that intense. Uh, so you take vector math, or I guess you could just use multiplication since this is a float input, but whatever. Uh, take this, set it to multiply or scale or anything that can control the magnitude of that vector. Again, colors are vectors. Uh, you take that scale, you bring it down, and you can think of this as variation, right? So when it's zero, it's going to be whatever color. Well, it's not going to be whatever color. It's going to be the color plus some offset, but all of these are going to be the same shade is the point. And the bigger the number is, the more variation we get. So now we get some oranges. These are some very fall-y colors. So you could do something like that, and then afterwards we want to do some offsetting. So that's uh, what addition is for. So we're going to have the same amount of variation. So let's say we have this amount of variation, uh, but now we can go through the color spectrum, kind of. Uh, so what do we have? We have colors, we have flickering, we have uh, moving and stuff like that. And again, at any point you can change any of these. If it flickers too much, if it moves too fast, you can control all these things. Um, in fact, I think I want to make a, a more intense threshold. So again, that less than is going to control the number of bokeh balls and stuff like that. Um, kind of last thing I want to talk about is how do we actually render this? So again, you can mess around with the settings. Um, this is, again, the node network. You just change parameters. Um, how do we render this, right? And you're thinking, okay, we have EV, we have a camera, you just hit render. Uh, the issue is if we were to do this, and I'm not going to do it uh, because it's going to take forever to render, and that's the point. If we do it, it's going to take forever to render, okay? <laughs> uh, so the way you fix this is let's say we take our render samples and bring them down to one, right? And you might be thinking, oh, that's horrible. It only does one pass. Well, let's render. You can see it doesn't take too long, and we get the bokeh balls. It looks like it did in the viewport, right? The thing is, if we were, and bake this into your memory, right? If we were to do the same thing, but this time bump it up to 7, right? Still very low. By default, it's 64, right? So we only up it to 7. We render again. And this is real time, by the way. You saw how much longer it took. It might look a tiny bit better, marginally. 
um, but it's not worth it, okay? Especially if you're doing a video where there's a lot of frames. So maybe set this to somewhere between one and five, ideally one or two, quite honestly, right? Um, so yeah, if you set it to 64, it's going to be insane. Also, another thing that makes or kind of makes or breaks your render, uh, depth of field settings. And again, this isn't physically based like cycles. This is EV, right? We're using a lot of cheats and stuff like this. Uh, we can control how much effort or how much, uh, you know, power, how much horsepower, EV is not a horse, but <laughs> how much horsepower is going into this, right? Um, we can actually make the depth of field take less, right? And it's going to look like a less blurred thing because it's kind of going through a smaller filter. This, maybe that's a way to think about it. Uh, point is, this controls the size of your bokeh, but also the smaller this number is, the faster it renders, right? Ideally, we want to keep this big. And if you want like super big bokeh balls, you can bump this up to 200 or something like that, but then it really gets low. Uh, keep this number, if you want to keep it at 100, keep it at two samples. If you want to like dip down lower to 50, you can bring up the samples as the point. Um, but, you know, you could do bloom, you could do all that kind of stuff. Um, ideally, maybe you don't even do bloom, right? You render, so this is what it looks like, and then you do the rest of the kind of glow stuff through compositing. Um, and this, and now I'm going off uh, the cuff, but uh, this is what we rendered, the render layer. You send this through white, you send it through a glare node probably, and then you probably pick a fog glow with a lower threshold uh, so that more of it's glowing. So you can see uh, here is the before and the after. And you could do a whole bunch of different kinds of glows. You could do streaks, you could do uh, ghosts, I don't even know. Uh, but this is how you do uh, some stuff. So I think at this point, uh, you, you know the thing, right? It's just a world shader and a camera. I don't think it, it's gone more simple than this. I've taken a long time to explain it, but whatever. Uh, so anyways, mess around with those parameters. But uh, I think that's the end of the tutorial. And as always, at the end of these tutorials, I do my elevator pitch. So uh, what are those names on the right? Is it a hit list? No, I've already used that joke. Is it a uh, to-do list? Also, no. Uh, it's a list of 650. It's a, it's a lot more since last I checked. 650 some patrons. Why are they patrons? Well, maybe uh, they want to support default Cuban CG matter channels. That'd be nice. Uh, but realistically, uh, they're getting stuff in return for being patrons. What are those things? Well, first of all, uh, they are getting blend files. Like this blend file, which I'm going to clean up and make parameters and all of this stuff. Um, this one file is going to be available on Patreon. You become a patron, you get access to any one file I've ever uploaded, uh, which might even be in the hundreds at this point. So one files, exclusive tutorials I upload every once in a while, um, especially to complement the CG Matter tutorials. A couple times a month, uh, those are posted over there. They're not... Uh, on CG Matter Default Cube, cube. <laughs> uh, they are exclusive tutorials. Um, additionally, Discord access, early access sometimes if I record a couple tutorials ahead, uh, behind the scenes, stuff like that. So if you are interested in that or you just want to support either or both or not neither, but <laughs> any other option of these channels, Patreon exists. There's a link in the description. Um, but other than that, Boca Balls and excruciating detail is now over. You know, it's over. It's over. It's... Oh, 